Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Brandon Furtig and I am with the Corporate Health and Wellness Association. The webinar being presented today is titled Coronavirus Legal Implications and Preparing for the Pandemic. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic as of yesterday, March 11th. While many people are ignorant of the facts, confusing this outbreak into just another flu, you have joined us today to get the real facts and prepare for the severity and impact on the workforce. Your interest as either employee or employer shows that you are ready to take proactive measures versus being forced to react. By the conclusion of this webinar, our hope is that you will be able to have a much better understanding of the nature and the scope of the virus, be able to identify legal liabilities, develop employer action plans, and know the difference between fact and fiction. Coming up in just a minute, you'll hear from three presenters. First, we have two presenters from Safarth Shaw, an international AmLaw 100 law firm headquartered in Chicago that focuses on labor laws and employment laws. Ms. Grossenbacher is a partner with Safarth Shaw's Washington, D.C. office and is chair of the Washington, D.C. labor and employment practice. Ms. Gro Grossenbacher also heads the firm's national workplace privacy team and co-chairs the firm's biometric privacy compliance and litigation practice. In addition, Ms. Grossenbacher serves on the steering committee of the firm's global privacy and security team. Adam Young is a senior associate at Safarth Shaw and counsels employers throughout the United States on a myriad of labor and employment law issues. Adam concentrates his practice on the area of workplace safety, the defense of OSHA inspe inspections and citations, whistleblower litigation, and uh, workplace safety counseling. Adam is an accomplished trial lawyer and has successfully tried OSHA and employment matters before federal and state courts. And finally, the chairman and co-founder of the Corporate Health and Wellness Association and Global Healthcare Resources, Jonathan Edelheit. Global Healthcare Resources reaches over 2 million executives and professionals through the association's portfolio of companies and its network. As chairman, Mr. Edelheit spends much of his time collaborating with C-suite executives of health insurance companies, employers and corporations, brokers, hospitals, and numerous governments both domestically and internationally on the adoption of innovation and disruption to produce outlier organizations. And with that, I hope everyone enjoys the webinar. Thank you, Brandon. So uh, excited to really bring this topic to you and have uh, you know our legal experts on the call, um, Adam and Carla, who will be presenting later. I'm gonna run through some slides to let everybody know kind of you know, what's, what's, what's going on with coronavirus, whether it's here or globally. Um, we're doing a series of educational webinars and launching a training program uh, and a certificate program in coronavirus and COVID-19 for employers. So we're gonna be bringing on top experts from around the country and the world to really share the knowledge, the facts, the insights, so that rather than watching uh, the news, the media, social media, where there's a lot of fear factor, a lot of misinformation, you can get that information directly from the experts. Uh, and tomorrow at 11, we have uh, Mark Lipsitch, who's one of the, the, probably the premier infectious disease expert in the world from Harvard, who's gonna really talk about what is COVID-19 and what does this really mean? And a kind of Q and A period also for employers. Um, so a couple things that I'd like to share because we're, we're getting more and more information as time goes on, but a lot of this information has been available for the last month or two. Um, you know, that's now really we're being disseminated out to, you know, the industry and to the, to the public. So the majority of employers, you know, we did a survey recently uh, just a week ago, uh, which we're going to be putting out uh, this coming week, but a majority of employers are unprepared for coronavirus. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, very, uh, you'll see the statistics, uh, you know, it looks about, it talks about them, you know, for training for themselves in the HR department or uh, training and communicating with their employees, uh, what they're prepared for, what they're not to. And I think it's very insightful. And that's, we, gives us time to look at how do we change how we're approaching this pandemic uh, and what strategies do we put in place? So um, one of the things is, the virus, according to the World Health Organization, has a currently a 3.4% mortality rate. 
Um, at the end of it, they're talking about potentially that it will be less um, because some of the experts are saying, you know, it could be anywhere from 30 to 60 percent. Some are saying everyone will be infected and therefore those rates will drop. But currently it's 3.4 percent fatality rate. It has been de designated a pandemic uh, just uh, yesterday, although the last couple of weeks, uh, infectious disease experts in the industry would basically say, hey, it's, it's already a pandemic. And a vaccine is about one to two years away. Um, there's a lot of talk of vaccines coming out in a couple months, uh, but clinical trials have to be run, you know, safety protocols have to be put in place. So it is going to take time for us to develop it. Um, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, came out yesterday and said that COVID-19 is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. Uh, I was very happy for this to finally be officially reported out there because this is the intel that we've been getting on the ground from around the world that we've been sharing with people over the last month. Um, and so uh, we need to stop the, 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 the myths and the misinformation being shared and dismissing this and saying, this is just like the flu, don't worry about it. And we need to get that message out to as many people as possible uh, so they can really be prepared. So if we look at COVID-19 versus influenza, um, you know, we put this chart together for you so you can really see it to also dispel that myth of it is the same. So I would like to point out 80, the 80 plus category. You know, um, my, my dad's 80. So there's a 14.8% death rate. Where with the flu, anyone over 65 was a 0.83% death rate or mortality rate. To, uh, to me, that's unacceptable that, you know, if, you know, my dad or my uncle who's, you know, turning 90, if he gets infected with this, he has a 14.8% chance of, of, of passing away. Um, so this is very important. This is, you know, I think a healthcare crisis that we need to take extremely seriously so we can protect older individuals and really inform them. Um, and I think it's important from uh, an employer perspective to be sharing this information with employees so that uh, how effective can an employee be in the workplace, for example, if their mother, their dad, their grandpa, their aunt, their uncle um, is one of these statistics. Uh, it doesn't become a statistic anymore, it becomes real. If we look at the age group of 50 to 59, there's a 1.3% death rate. And with the flu, between 50 to 64, it was a 0.06%. That's a significant, massive increase in the number of uh, fatality. So you go, if you have an employee who's 50 to 59, and they decide tomorrow uh, to go out to a concert or a public place, and you know 100 of those people were infected by, by uh, multiple people through community spread, you know, you're saying one out of 100 of them will pass away, where before it was a 0.06% uh, you know, chance. So these statistics are significantly higher. Um, obviously, younger children are less at risk, um, you know, but there's a lot of uh, misnomers and misinformation going around saying kids are totally safe. Um, you know, if you talk to the top children's hospitals, they'll let you know that there is no statistics yet. There's not enough data to determine who's safe, who's not. And also, if someone is, has a compromised immune system or chronic conditions, uh, even if they're young, they're susceptible to the same fatality risks uh, as uh, a, 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 that will show a little bit later. And so when you see younger people, uh, 34, 35, you know, go critical in the IC or pass away, you know, those are people with a chronic condition or a suppressed immune system. Um, and I think this is all about information. So if we look at chronic diseases and the mortality rate, with uh, COVID-19, 13.2% um, of people with a cardiovascular disease, uh, if they're infected, will die. 9.2% of people with diabetes. Do we know how many people have diabetes here in the US and around the world? Those numbers are huge. 8.4% of people with chronic respiratory disease uh, will, will, who get infected will die. 8% of hypertension and 7.6% of cancer patients. You know, so when you hear somebody say, oh, this is just the flu, when is the last time you heard of someone who has cancer getting the flu having a 7.6% chance of dying or someone with diabetes catching the flu and having almost a 10%? Uh, and then one study uh, that was done out of, uh, out of China was that individuals with um, the above these diseases have a 79% greater chance of requiring intensive care or being on a respirator. Um, so one of the things does is it attacks your lungs intensely, and a lot of uh, the patients who get sick 
uh, and have complications or have these chronic diseases, they're in um, the IC unit, IC unit on respirators. And then the same comment I would say is when was the last time that happened with the flu? So it's totally not the flu and hopefully we'll start seeing more in the community share this. Um, I just wanna show some pictures because I want people to understand what's coming here to the United States. Um, you know, because I think that a lot of people in the U.S. aren't really watching the international media, watching the stories to see what happens. So this is an example of an ICU uh, patient ward in China. So it affects people with pneumonia. I said it attacks the lungs very intensely and the ICU wards get crushed. They get absolutely overwhelmed and it's very difficult for the hospitals to deal with that. And our intel with some of the hospitals here in the U.S., that's already happening to them. Also, one of the challenges is, and then also, um, I'll talk about uh, people with chronic diseases going to the hospital. It's something that we have to really focus on protecting, you know, our employees that have chronic diseases or our loved ones. But China built dedicated hospitals just to deal with coronavirus. Um, we don't have that luxury in the U.S., so we're going to have to be sending them to the hospitals that are treating people with other conditions. Um, this is just a few days ago. Uh, so I'm sharing this one, once again, for everyone who says, COVID-19 is like the flu. This is a 35-year-old uh, woman in Nebraska who was the first COVID-19 coronavirus patient. So, you know, when was the last time the paramedics had to be in hazmat suits? And when was the last time they had to put someone in a containment bubble when they were transferring to the hospital for the flu? It doesn't happen. This is extremely, um, you know, a serious virus that really affects people intensely. And we need to be prepared for it and also realize that, you know, the emergency responders, the paramedics, these people, they're going to be um, overwhelmed, too, because imagine, you know, the fact that they have to wear, um, you know, hazmat suits. They got to put people in bubbles. It's, you know, they're not going to have the time they had to to deal with other emergent situations. Um, and, you know, we look at what's going on around the world. Italy has gone into lockdown. The whole country is in quarantine. Uh, we're seeing other countries, um, you know, put up, uh, close their borders, uh, start canceling flights inbound into their country. You know, Italy is trying to recruit retire, retired doctors because they don't have enough health care workers to treat the patients. Um, and one of the challenges with that is those retired doctors, you know, if they're over 80, they're coming into the hospital and they have a 14.8% chance of fatality themselves. And then one of the unfortunate challenges, which is coming here, is then the healthcare workers, uh, you know, get infected, um, you know, and then that, and then the there's a, a lack of resources of nurses and doctors to work with the patient. So this is already happening, um, you know, doctors, nurses getting infected, uh, you know, from treating coronavirus and COVID-19 patients, um, and then they, you know, are infecting other people. So it just creates a lot of logistical challenges and and really nightmares that our healthcare system is not really prepared for. And this is South Korea, um, just how they're, you know, cleaning, you know, some of the shopping areas and consumer markets. And I want to share these pictures because this is, you know, uh, we need to learn from the best practices of what other countries who have been fighting this for a month or three months are doing, realize what's potentially coming and understand, you know, how this will affect our daily lives, the, you know, you know, the employers, the employees, business, logistic, all these different things. And this is why our organization has been spending the last couple months, you know, on the ground and working with governments and hospitals all over the world, you know, to really dig deep into this so we can, you know, launch our education and training program to really prepare everyone, you know, for uh, the, the, what's going to happen with this pandemic. Um, uh, also, just, to, you know, to be aware, you know, for example, in China, one of the implications, I think this is very important for employers is, uh, and it's not really talked about in the media, if you had cancer, um, if you know you were getting chemo, if you needed to go to the hospital for an operation, uh, you know, really most of those hospitals would turn away those patients um, in, in China because they, they basically, the hospitals all turned into coronavirus hospitals and they just didn't have any capacity to treat those people. Also something that nobody has thought about is that um, patients who have serious illness or chronic conditions, I mentioned before cancer, diabetes, heart disease and things, when they go into the hospital setting, they're at risk to catch the coronavirus and they're the most vulnerable patients. Um, you know, so they're at a very high risk of catching it. And then they have that high uh, fatality rate, whether it's three to up to 10%. Um, and in reality, uh, you know, I have a neighbor down the street who, you know, they're in their late sixties. His wife is um, 
going for starting chemo next week for 52 weeks. Uh, and, you know, he was telling me, you know, he's really scared because he's got to bring his wife into the hospital, you know, and he's been looking for a mask for months um, so that when she goes into the hospital, she's reducing the risk uh, of getting the cancer. And, and so we need to start thinking of these scenarios and what do we do? How do we accommodate these requests? Because it's not just the 60 year old, it's the, you know, 40, 50 year old employee working for you that needs access to this medical care and thinking about what are different scenarios. And obviously telehealth will play a great role in some parts. Um, you know, the expectation is we're going to see, you know, majority, if not all of the schools close. Uh, we're already seeing that all over the world. You know, 26 countries, uh, you know, have had countrywide um, school closures and we're seeing, you know, um, counties across the U.S. closing it. So, you know, uh, it's, it's great to learn from the countries that are getting hit with this first so we can better prepare for ourselves. And you're seeing a lot of events being banned. Um, you saw the CDC say don't go on cruise ships. Uh, the NBA just suspended its season. It'll be closed, uh, uh, you know, uh, sports for spectators. France, you know, has banned events over certain sizes. See, all these things are happening because the goal is to contain the virus and stop the spread, what they call community spread when people spread it amongst themselves. And that's what we really have to focus on. Um, uh, things that, you know, really aren't being talked about is multinational companies. How do multinational companies even navigate this um, when they have employees all over the world? If you have expats in Europe, for example, and, you know, the government bans flights from Europe, how do you get that employee home? What does that employee do? What's the, you know, the employer's responsibility? So there's a lot of logistics that are happening, um, you know, that you have to have considerations. If a country closes its border, which we've already seen happen, you know, or stuck in a quarantine zone, what do you do as a company? Um, and, uh, and these are not scenarios that there's a book you can just open. Um, you really have to figure them out. And then also, what if you have, you know, are there, uh, you know, employees that can't work remote? Um, you know, they don't have the ability to work because they're kind of front, they're on the front lines, you know, someone, you know, out commercial fishing, catching fish that we need to eat, you know, food processing, manufacturing, the custodial, um, there's a lot of industries that we need to keep running. Uh, and what happens when, um, you know, you know, if they're somehow not able to get to work, what if they want to work remotely? I'm sure that will be covered a little bit later. Um, but there's a lot of things that we actually have to think about and prepare uh, when we talk about community spread, the one thing I would like to share, because all the infectious disease specialists would talk about social responsibility, and this is extremely important if we're going to really try, um, you know, not only help try to stop the spread of it, but also to protect the most vulnerable people, because I think a lot of us don't think of it. I'm young. I'm healthy. Uh, you know, they, they keep saying 80 percent of people or more are going to be totally fine. But what we don't think about is the, the implications of how we can get other people sick, you know. So you know, you know, a 20-year-old man goes to the cashier, and you know, through contact with the cashier, gets COVID-19. You know, he comes home, you know, and he meets his wife. His wife ends up catching it. His wife then meets with her 80-year-old mother and spreads the virus to her. Boom, 14.8% fatality rate. Um, you know, and people aren't really thinking about this, and it's hard for us, I think, to conceive right now. Um, but it is going to become a reality a little bit later. And there's, you know, scenarios that we're going to publish later of, of like this, of where it could be happening in the workplace and what we really need to think about. Um, another example is, you know, uh, mom, you know, passes COVID-19 to her daughter. Her daughter uh, passes it to a friend at school. That, that kid passes it to her mother. And her mother has, uh, goes and hangs out with her sister who actually has cancer. You know, now that, you know, that sister has a very high statistic of fatality that is very unfortunate. So we need to consider the implications and take seriously, you know, our impact and what we personally can do if we're young or healthy to reduce the, you know, the impact, this, the, the heavy impact this can have on other people. So I think we need to expect and businesses need to, you know, create plans of, you know, significant disruption to the businesses and to the into the economy, you know, China's entire country shut down, um, and uh, China actually, you know, basically has been fighting this for months like a war, um, you know. So it's very important to to realize that you know life will not just continue as normal, business will not continue as normal, there, and it will be changed. It could be you know progressively where we have time, or it can happen fast. You just have to think about all the considerations. How do you protect your workforce, liability, and things that I know Adam and Carla are going to give some really great. Uh, 
um, information on. You know, uh, one of the things that we saw was in our survey that a majority of employers have not um, trained their employees and prepared them for COVID-19. Um, and I think that employers really are the first line of defense in really educating and, pr and, pr and preparing their employees for it. And you got to have strategies to maintain, you know, how you're going to maintain the health and wellness of your uh, employees, um, develop that comprehensive training or partner with organizations that do. Um, and one thing that we have to realize is um, just like we dispelled the myth before about the flu is the same as COVID-19, don't look at the number of cases um, because in many cases we haven't been testing. We're just starting to test. Um, and also there's been problems with the test kits. So I think a lot of people are taking comfort as there's only 10 or 20 in my state, um, when in reality there could be thousands or tens of thousands. Nobody knows, um, you know, and there's not a lot of symptoms. The CDC, I live in Florida, the CDC said yesterday um, that there's community spread in Florida. Uh, and then the governor of Florida just said, no, there isn't. Um, so there's a lot of conflicting information and messages out there. So really stay informed and and you know and understand what's going on um it's important that you develop solutions now you do not wait um you know i've been talking to people about this for a month uh about you know how it how this is going to progress and how this is going to happen and some things will move slow and some things will move fast where you wake up and something has changed is significant so really prepare for it um as i said before uh you know all the top experts say one to two years for a vaccine so don't think there's a quick fix Mark, who's presenting tomorrow uh, from Harvard, uh, one of the things that he even put out a paper on it's talked about is there's no evidence that it's, it's going to burn away in the summer. And, and please realize this is affecting countries that have a very hot climate right now. So people shouldn't be hoping for just a miracle to make this go away. Um, so there's a lot of con considerations, remote work, uh, you know, you know, employees that are frontline. Are you cross training employees now to prepare? Um, have, are you looking at new models of how to interact with your customers or vendors or employees? Um, you know, what strategies are you implementing? How are you communicating with employees? Um, how are you protecting your employees? And what are you doing with supply chain uh, interruptions? And as I had said earlier, um, you know, we've launched the comprehensive training program that will kick off over the next, you know, four to five weeks. And then we're going to be adding a lot of resources to our online learning management system that employers can use internally to prepare, to strategize for scenarios and also things they can use to share and communicate with their employees. Um, and I just think that, you know, now is the time to really prepare um, and to understand all these issues and create, you know, your plans, uh, you know, your teams within your company to handle pandemic, but also how to focus on the stress and mental health issues that this is gonna bring to employees and really how do you avoid productivity loss, loss of profits, um, absenteeism, presenteeism, all these different issues. It's, very complex. This is not something you can learn on just one webinar. Um, and then at the end of it, we're going to be giving a certificate out uh, to those people that have gone through it. So with that, um, you know, we've got our two experts here, uh, Adam and Carla, that are going to really share with us, I think, very important knowledge that people need to understand and know to, um, you know, deal with what's going on within the workplace. So I'll turn it over to uh, Carla and Adam. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> as Jonathan explained, my name is Adam Young, and I'm here with Carla Grossenbacher. We're both from Sidebar Shaw. We're a, a national uh, labor and employment practice. Um, I don't know if someone else could advance the slide for me. It's actually, I, I don't have control. Right, so we're going to be discussing uh, the legal liabilities and employment issues relating to uh, to coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> I'm from a workplace safety group uh, here at Cypher Shaw, so I specialize in OSHA, the defense of OSHA citation, and uh, workplace counseling on sa safety matters. Uh, we do have a task force that's set up for COVID-19. So we have a group of attorneys all across the world from from uh, Cypher who we're looking at every aspect of employment law, and that includes wage and hour law, traditional labor law, um, and issues that might come up outside of our areas of expertise. So there may be questions that, that is not our area specifically of expertise, but we can, we can refer you to the right person who can answer your question as it relates to coronavirus. If you could do next slide, that'd be great. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, so today we're going to talk about those those potential legal liabilities that, that surround the coronavirus, um, how employers can address those from, from an OSHA perspective, from an employment law perspective, and how to develop a policy and develop an action plan on, on how to deal with that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so identify potential legal liabilities. I, I don't know how, how many folks got to catch the president's statement um, last night, but I, obviously there's been a very cha much change in, in tenor and policy of the United States. Um, th this slide concerns the White House proclamation on preventing folks of uh, Chinese nationality from entering the country. That was issued back in January 31st of 2020. As of last night, at least according to the president, he's a, creating a similar ban for European nationals other than the UK. Um, from entering the United States. I haven't seen the written document from the White House yet, um, though I was looking this morning. I don't believe they put one out yet, but I, I believe that it's gonna have similar restrictions. So it's gonna prevent people who are not US citizens or US permanent residents from entering the United States. It's not going to, excuse me, it's not gonna prevent those who are US citizens or permanent residents from entering the United States. It's only gonna prohibit European nationals from entering the United States. So it's a limited restriction on on who can enter the US, much like there was with China. Uh, as we've seen so far, and again, we're not gonna comment on the scientific and, and medical aspects of it, but we've seen a lot of transmission from US nationals who are returning from these places. So the, the utility of that, of that in terms of public policy is probably an issue for someone else to discuss. Uh, next, next slide, please. All right, so Occupational Safety and Health Administration is uh, a federal agency. It operates in every state, but there's also 26 state plans uh, that do occupational safety and health law in those respective states, California being a prominent one amongst them. It's very active in issuing uh, regulations and issuing interpretations, and they've been active in the federal OSHA has been active in the coronavirus space, and California OSHA is as well, or Cal OSHA as it's called. Um, OSHA has 30,000 regulations governing employers, uh, whether they're in general industry, maritime, or construction. Uh, it also has something called the general duty clause. And the general duty clause, it, that requires employers to create a work environment that's free from any recognized hazard that could cause death or serious physical harm. So there's no specific regulations as of yet that address coronavirus, um, but there are is this general duty clause and there is a potential for citation. Uh, typically when OSHA regulates an industry or a, a practice or hazard under the general duty clause, they look to secondary sources. They look to what's understood in the industry. Uh, is the employer following the guidance that's out there? Um, and, you know, the, the key guidance we're seeing for employers is, is from the CDC and from your local health authorities. The local health authorities are demanding that certain action be taken. OSHA is going to, going to be looking at that, uh, that action and see if the employer is complying with it. And then that could be the basis for, for general duty clause issues with OSHA. Um, you know, I was at the OSHA convention last week, and as of Wednesday of last week, they said they'd only received 32 complaints related to coronavirus. Uh, as of this week, one area office told me they'd received over 1,500 complaints. So one, there's maybe 200 area offices in the United States. One already is getting 1,500 complaints about employer practices, about the suspicious people in the facility that they thought might have coronavirus. So there's been a lot of action out there on OSHA. Um, they're getting these complaints and, and they, they've issued guidance as well. Um, there has been push from the traditional labor uh, advocates like Mr. Trumka for the AFL-CIO um, issued a request for OSHA to issue some sort of temporary coronavirus standard. I think that's unlikely to be issued, but they have put out recommendations. And those recommendations from OSHA warn about, about the hazard, about the types of jobs uh, where folks may be at risk, um, the different strategies that must be uh, used to address that, and training, right? A lot of the OSHA citations we see employers getting relate to training and uh, lack of training by employees. So the OSHA's put out this recommendation on training. We recommend employers um, take a look at it. It talks about, you know, training employees on the differences between seasonal epidemics and, and this pandemic, the job activities that would put them at risk, options for working remotely if that's possible, social distancing, hygiene, personal protective equipment, medical services. Um, and while, while we believe the general duty clause uh, is an area that OSHA could enforce against employers, relying on those, those guidance documents and the CDC recommendations that have been put out there, we believe that if employers are following um, the recommendations from the CDC, 
they are staying in touch uh, with OSHA's recommendations. We, we think they can minimize liabilities for a general duty clause violation. There are OSHA standards as well that regulate personal protective equipment and when it needs to be used and provided. And that, that would apply to things like gloves. There's OSHA standards and state standards that address hygiene. Um, I, I know in California, for example, there's certain requirements as to washing facilities at, at work sites. Um, there's no requirement that employers have Purell, um, but you do have to have a workplace free from recognized hazards. So if you don't have adequate sinks, it may mean that, that you do that, that personal hazard assessment or that work site hazard assessment, find out your potential exposures, and then you, you address them with, with proper safety abatement. Um, and another standard that, that may be applicable to, to coronavirus issues is the respiratory protection standard. You know, you see a lot of employers who aren't used to having masks at the work site suddenly have respirators and masks. And we saw a congressman on the floor of Congress wearing a full face respirator. Well, actually, you know, you can't just give an employee a respirator. That that congressman out of the OSHA regs, he he had to have a if he were an employee at a company, he had to have a medical evaluation and a fit test before he could lawfully wear that. And the reason why, at least according to OSHA, is it could present a serious risk of injury or death if you are not a appropriate candidate to be wearing a respirator in the first place. If you're handing out something that, uh, not a surgical mask, which doesn't create a negative pressure, but, but something that covers a, a tight fitting N95 um, dust mask, you, you are required to provide training to employees on that. It's called the Appendix D training. Uh, it's available online. It's a handout sheet. It explains to them the risk of wearing that type of mask. It may, for some individuals, it may create greater risk than, than the risk it's preventing. Um, there's also issues with regard to those masks being available. Um, but we see from an OSHA liability perspective, masks and respirators coming into new areas and new employers that are familiar with them um, creates a, uh, a real problem. So we, we recommend, again, that, that employers do that hazard assessment for their own work site and, and come up with an action plan of how you're going to identify hazards, what you're going to do to address them, uh, how you're going to train employees. You're going to keep following the CDC, their recommendations, your local health authorities. I, mean, I know if you're in my state, for example, the Department of Public Health is putting out information on, on what employers should be doing. Um, there is a record keeping standard under OSHA as well. So if you're required to maintain an OSHA 300 log, that's a log of all your injuries and illness. Uh, typically under OSHA, you're not required to record certain illnesses like the flu or the cold. OSHA's materials they put out say that uh, for coronavirus, you need to record those coronavirus cases if we believe they're work related. Um, so if you're in a healthcare field, which a lot of the folks on the line are, I, I would imagine that there's a, a geographic presumption that it's more likely than not that if someone got coronavirus, they probably got it through work if they're interacting with uh, with coronavirus patients or coronavirus treatment. So there may be a recording obligation there that, that OSHA has put employers on notice of. And I'll turn things over to Carla if we want to advance to the next slide. Oh, wait, sorry, it's still me. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, th these are the prevention tips, which we're not going to go into too much, but these face mask issues are, are at issue um, with regard to employers and, and complying with that respiratory protection standard. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so there's a lot of different areas of law that, that uh, coronavirus is, is affecting, and there's potential liabilities in all of those. Um, it, within employment law, there is this area of workers' compensation, too. So if, if folks receive an, an injury or illness at work and it's arising out of in the course of employment, there may be liability for workers' compensation, which is something that will be played out when, when they file a claim with their carrier. Um, you know, if it's arising out of in the course of that work, it's, it's likely to be compensable. Uh, I'm not a workers' compensation expert myself, but if anyone has questions on, on workers' compensation, we'd be happy to provide more information in that area. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is where I'm going to pick up from an employment law perspective. So this slide is about the FMLA, but I'm going to use it to talk about uh, leave for employees and payment of those employees while they're on leave generally. Um, so what we're seeing among our clients who have been asking these questions of us uh, for the past several weeks is, you know, what do we do with someone who is coming to work and they are symptomatic. Uh, they're coughing, they're sneezing, they look like they have a fever, they don't look well. Um, the easy part of that is if someone's sick, you send them home. And when they're sick, they don't work, and they use sick leave or whatever paid leave is 
available to them. There's a lot of states that have paid sick leave laws that would come into play here and provide additional benefits. Um, there's also FMLA, which I have up on the screen here with some reminders of when that applies. FMLA, of course, is on paid leave, but many employer policies provide that you have to substitute paid leave that's available to you. And if someone is sick in their home, uh, they could be on FMLA and also taking sick leave. They could also uh, apply for short-term disability. So depending on your plan or your policy, they may or may not qualify for uh, the word disabled within the meaning of your plan or policy. It's possible that if it goes on for a long time, perhaps if they're an at-risk person, uh, it might be turning into long-term disability. The other leave issue that we uh, confront uh, or our clients confront regularly is what to do with people who aren't symptomatic but have engaged in conduct that puts them at high risk for infection. So they just got back from a cruise. They just got back from a geographic area that the CDC has said is level two or level three. Uh, what do you do with those people? Or maybe they uh, have someone that they live with or who are otherwise in close personal contact with who have a positive a uh, case for COVID-19. In those scenarios, most of our clients are sending those people home for 14 days. Um, and then if they want to come back to the workplace, they need to have a fit for duty. Um, no. And it's easy in the sense that if the person is not symptomatic and they're working from home, they're just paid as normal, they work as normal. But as we saw on the slide earlier, not everybody can perform their work uh, from home. So what do you do with those people? Well, uh, the wage hour law, state and federal, uh, state that you don't have to pay people who are performing work for you as an employer. What I can tell you anecdotally is that most of our clients are paying employees who they want to stay home for 14 days because they believe they're at risk of being positive for COVID-19 based on the scenarios I just mentioned. Um, and because they have, as the employer, that general duty under OSHA, they are telling us they're willing to take the hit and pay those employees to stay home rather than confront an employee who can't be paid, who's insisting on coming to work because they don't have any symptoms, um, because they want to fulfill that general duty obligation to keep the workplace safe. The only uh, scenario that we've seen our clients differ on this practice uh, is if the high-risk uh, status comes from a personal choice. So you went to a wedding in China, and now you want to come back. Uh, no one told you you had to do that. That was your personal choice. And if we're going to tell you you can't come to work for 14 days, uh, some of our clients are saying we're not going to pay in those circumstances because that was a personal choice someone made to put themselves in an at-risk category. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide uh, because some of these issues that I just discussed um, are informed by an employer's obligation under the ADA. So how does the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, fit into COVID-19? So the ADA says a few things about how we as employers uh, treat people with disabilities. You can't discriminate against someone who has a disability. A person with a disability who does not pose a direct threat has the right to come to work. And the third thing is that uh, employers have an obligation to accommodate employees with disabilities. So how is this playing out uh, in the case of COVID-19? Um, the EEOC has put out a guidance on pandemic preparedness. Uh, there are several things. You can uh, get this. Uh, the link is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, all employers should give this document a read. The EEOC pushed it out again uh, last weekend or the weekend before. Um, you'll note that most of the things in the guidance uh, are in effect when there is a pandemic. Now, the uh, World Health Organization has declared a pandemic. The CDC has not declared a pandemic, and the EEOC guidance says it has to be both of them. Uh, so there's some people who are taking the position, well, for purposes of the EEOC guidance, it's not a pandemic. Um, I personally am of the belief that uh, I don't think the EEOC is going to draw that particular distinction. And if an employer follows their guidance, seeing them for doing that, because it's not quite a pandemic yet. Uh, I just don't see that happening, but that's just my personal opinion. So what does this EEOC guidance say? Uh, it says a few uh, key points. One, it's okay as an employer to ask people if they have um, engaged in travel that has exposed them potentially to the coronavirus. You can always ask about travel. It's not a disability-related inquiry. That's one of the things that the uh, ADA prohibits is medical exams and medical inquiries that are disability-related, unless they are 
are job related and consistent with business necessity. So you can see that perhaps hospitals uh, have a different uh, line of attack on that saying, for example, we're going to take the temperature of a nurse that's treating patients in the ICU to make sure she doesn't have a fever. That's another question we're getting from a lot of our clients. Can we take the temperature of our employees to make sure they don't have fevers? Now, the EEOC guidance says generally, no, you cannot do that. It is a medical exam. But what it does say also is that if there's a scenario in which uh, COVID-19 is more severe than seasonal influenza, um, then yes, you can take temperatures. So we saw slides uh, earlier from Jonathan indicating that it is much more severe. Uh, however, we all know there's a mainstream dialogue as well that it's not as severe. And depending on the person we're speaking about, it could be that it's not severe in the sense that they are never going to develop severe uh, symptoms. So it's a bit of a gray area. Uh, we can tell you that anecdotally, we have clients who are taking temperatures of employees in Seattle before they come into the workplace. And so far, nothing has happened to any of them. Again, we're not in a position to say what the EEOC is going to make of all of that. Uh, I listed on the slide some possible accommodations for people. Um, so accommodations are for people with disabilities. So it could be that there are people who are in your workforce who say that they are immunosuppressed and they don't want to come to work because they are at higher risk of infection. And the EEOC says you need to accommodate those people uh, with some of the things that you see here, such as work from home or leave, could be leave without pay. Um, the other thing uh, that the EEOC guidance says is that you can request it for duty forms from employees, that these are not disability related inquiries because all you're doing is saying, are you able to perform your job? And part of that is your risk, you're free from a contagion and you're not preventing uh, risk to people of further contagion. So you can always get a fit for duty note uh, from employees. Uh, if they're going on FMLA leave, you should check that box on the designation form saying you're requiring a fit for duty form in order to be reinstated. Um, you know, there's guidance from the CDC that says, hey, don't ask for fit for duty letters because you're gonna put a run on all the doctor's offices uh, trying to get these letters. In many areas of the country, we aren't seeing that kind of busyness among doctor's offices yet. Uh, so right now it hasn't been a problem for our clients to request those fit for duty letters. The EEOC guidance does say that employers should be flexible about that. Um, employers should accept an email from a doctor's office and not, you know, some specific form, something like that. Again, to ease the burden um, on physicians' offices. Uh, the last thing I want to say about the uh, ADA is, of course, um, and uh, discrimination laws in general, is that we can't be engaging in stereotypical thinking about people, that people from certain countries of certain ancestries are at higher risk for COVID-19 simply because it started in China and we're seeing a lot of cases in South Korea uh, and Japan and places like that. Um, exposure to the virus is very different from whatever your nationality or ancestry is. Uh, it's not based on that. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just a final note on uh, people returning to work. Uh, so you can always request medical documentation if someone has been on leave for a disability-related reason. Uh, you as the employer have the right to ask for that information. Again, you can require a fit-for-duty note. Um, employers uh, may encounter employees who are asking questions about people who are absent from work. Uh, did they test positive? What is their situation? Uh, the ADA has a very strict confidentiality provision. Uh, we can't uh, give away people's medical information that we as employers collect uh, in the line of, you know, accommodating people or otherwise. And the exceptions under the ADA are very few and far between. There's just a couple of them, and they generally don't apply in scenarios like this. Uh, so we've got to keep that information confidential. Uh, you know, we have clients who tell people in their workforce that, yes, We've had a positive case in this office, in this department within this office, uh, so that people can, you know, uh, self-monitor and things like that, but not giving anyone's name and not giving anyone specific uh, medical status. Uh, so, uh, next slide. All right, I'm going to turn things back over to Adam for this one. We can't hear you, Adam, or at least I can't. Sorry, thank you, Carla. Yeah, in terms of OSHA, I talked about OSHA 
and uh, its application to your own employees. It, it, it's actually a holistic statute. It applies to the whole work site. So if, if there's other employees at the work site, there's potential liability for uh, those employees to the extent that you're the controlling employer, you're exposing employees to a hazard. Uh, and that, that's true from an employment perspective. And there's this, also this property um, law side of it where there's premises liability. If, if you're the landowner and you have visitors coming on, you could potentially be liable for your own negligence. And this is an important area. Not Again, this is outside of employment, so not our area of specialization, but it is the specialization of someone on our task force. Uh, but to the extent you're aware of, of liabilities that relate to, uh, uh, or excuse me, hazards that relate to coronavirus in, in the ventilation system or folks that are working there, or people that have exposed um, others at the work site, that would be a, a potential source of legal liability as well. Um, so we, we do recommend that you take action uh, to prevent those. If we have the next slide, please. All right, so we recommend uh, employers do develop an action plan to deal with this coronavirus. If you go next slide. <clears throat> right, so that would include designating individuals who are going to be your, your chief task force for coronavirus, developing a written program as to what you're going to do. If, for example, if if your program is going to say that employees will be working from home or telecommuting at some point, you should have a reference as to when you're gonna make that decision and how you're gonna make that decision. Um, you may also have a work from home policy that addresses the expectations uh, when folks are working from home and, and how they should be doing that. Um, in terms of if you do have cases at work and you're going to be closing a work site based on potential exposure at work, how are you gonna sanitize that work? What types of personal protective equipment and what types of cleaning agents are going to be used during the sanitization? Or are you going to be using an outside qualified third party specialty contractor who could come in and do that sanitization? Um, in terms of that action plan, you know, we want the policy communicated, we want the plan communicated to folks um, who are at the, uh, at the work site. And then a big part of that program should be monitoring the CDC's uh, recommendations, monitoring public health recommendations as they go forward. I don't know, Carla, if you have anything else you'd like to talk about on this employer action plan area. Okay, so yeah, th those are our, our general questions, our general issues that, that we recommend. Uh, we, we, we'd like to open the floor to any questions, Jonathan, that, that folks may have out there. Yeah, that would be great. Um, one question that came in is you were mentioning action plans. Um, is Where do they get these? Can they just get them somewhere or, or how would they even create them on their own? Right, so we've helped a lot of employers create policies and create action plans. You can develop it, uh, your own plan, if you want to, based on recommendations from OSHA. And if you go to OSHA's website, they'll have that. If you, you go to the CDC's website, there's a lot of information on how to create a plan and, and things to target and, and how to deal with that. I don't know, Carla, if you have any other thoughts on that. Uh, no, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the response plan is more of an OSHA-type uh, obligation. Okay. Uh, another question that had come in was, um, you know, are there, you know, new laws that you see being established um, or that need to be put in place in order to, you know, to accommodate things that are going to happen with, um, with, with coronavirus going forward? I think we're seeing some activity on both the federal and state level with bills being introduced uh, relating to additional leave uh, for employees. Uh, and requiring that. Uh, I don't know that any have been uh, passed at the moment, but there is activity sending up bills uh, of that nature. And um, I can just also add that there's a lot of employers who are coming up with coronavirus specific policies. Um, you know, we have a lot of employers putting in place uh, temporary telecommuting policies, um, enhanced sick leave policies uh, that was encouraged uh, for example, by um, the government of Seattle, King County, telling employers they need to be more flexible about sick leave, make it more available to people so everyone is incentivized to stay home. All right, and we, we have tons of sample language for folks. So, you know, if you're interested in that type of policy, contact Carla, contact me. Um, I think our emails are on this presentation. So, as on the thank you slide, so we would be happy to get in touch with you about those or, or questions you may have. Uh, another question was, um, it, you know, is there any circumstance where an employer would be liable if they terminated an employee who 
didn't come into work or wouldn't come into work because of uh, you know coronavirus, but that specific position required them to be you know present and not telecommute. Yeah, so there are refusal to perform regulations uh, under the, the federal regulations where an employee has a very limited uh, right to refuse to perform work that they reasonably believe to be unsafe. And generally, it means you can't walk off the job entirely. So unless there are specific facts indicating that there, there's a coronavirus risk at that work site, um, it's probably not protected activity to refuse to come to work entirely. Um, and would you be potentially getting sued because you terminate that person? Well, obviously, you, you can always be sued. Anyone can always sue you in this country. Um, but I think you'd have pretty strong defenses, assuming the facts as I, as I explained them. Uh, and the other question. thing I would add is, depending on the reason they want to do that, obviously, if they're doing that because they think they have a medical condition that puts them at greater risk, then obviously there's an ADA issue with terminating someone like that. That leads into my next question, Carla, is, uh, you know, someone had asked, you know, if you have to accommodate people, let's say, with chronic conditions so they can work remotely because of the uh, coronavirus, and you can't ask people their health, you know, what health condition they have, how do you know that it is legitimate? Or what if you have a company where all the employees say, you know, I've got a chronic condition, I need to work from home? Uh, as an employer, you're uh, able to request medical documentation that establishes the necessity for the accommodation. So while the um, treating physician or what, whoever it is going to fill it out doesn't have to tell you what the disability is, they do have to certify that someone has a medical condition uh, that prevents them from doing X, Y, Z, and as an accommodation, they need to stay home or whatever. And then we have seen a lot of questions about this, particularly from employees who have some sort of immunosuppression going on for, for treatment or some other underlying disability. And that's not just staying home, but they may request other accommodations, like they want a parking spot instead of taking the L or uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, how... Uh, one employer asked, how well prepared is OSHA, um, you know, and even issues with the ADA really uh, where the regulations are prepared for the situation that's unfolding, you know, since we haven't had a pandemic before. So I would say OSHA is very unprepared and they don't know a lot about this area. Most of the health issues they deal with are things like lead or asbestos exposure. Um, so I don't, I don't think they have a great concept of how to deal with it. Their policies require them to take action anytime they get a complaint. So they either need to open an inspection or send a letter. And if an area office is getting 1,500 calls, that they're way understaffed to be able to deal with that level of complaint. And the EEOC, I mean, they don't seem inclined to give employers any kind of indication of how they're going to view these issues, right? All they did was recirculate a pandemic preparedness guidance that they issued in 2009. Um, seemingly, the reissuing of it says we think it still applies, nothing's different, a pandemic is a pandemic, um, but I think they also reissued it under the assumption that it's very similar to the flu because that pandemic preparedness guidance was from the H1N1 era. Well, hopefully they'll update it soon. Um, yeah. For um, uh, what happens if OSHA uh, or, you know, or other government organizations that are involved in enforcing things um, if they end up working remotely um, because of this, you know, how does that affect how the employers, you know, are dealing with this or even the employees? Um, and could the rules that are in place now, and let's say technically an employer violates the rules, could OSHA later, a couple months later, you know, come and retroactively change those based upon the scenario? Right. So there's a due process issue about creating new rules down the line and then enforcing them against an employer. So you, you would have a defense to that. If, if, as you said, they're telecommuting, they're not doing inspections, that doesn't mean they couldn't come in five months later and say, well, we know that this uh, violation took place five months ago. We're still within our statute of limitations. And they could issue enforcement citations against an employer because of that. Mm -hmm. Because I think the challenge is, is that if um, we haven't gone through this scenario, you know, uh, you know, how do employers make decisions in the event of scenarios that have not come up, you know, before? Um, you know, is that something where they turn to, you know, their attorneys and say, what do we do in this circumstance? Or do they have to contact OSHA? You know, if OSHA is overwhelmed, 
um, you know, it could be with complaints or just other issues is, is uh, you know, where, where, would, where should the employer turn for guidance? Yeah, the, GOSHA has put out guidance on what they should be doing, as I discussed, in terms of training. Uh, and an area where it's a new and developing area and, and they're, you know, engaging in new and sometimes aggressive enforcement, we, we have seen that they often play Monday morning quarterback, right? If, if you have something you haven't prepared adequately, you don't have an action plan in place, you don't have training, you have some terrible outbreak, they get a complaint about it or they do an inspection that could result in serious citations and, and it could result in really damaging PR. Uh, statements, you know, being put out there by the agency, which, uh, uh, in, at least in the workplace violence context or other context we've seen in the past, can, can be very damaging for a company's reputation. Great. Um, any any closing thoughts or remarks, Adam or Carla, as we wrap up uh, the webinar? Well, thank you very much for having us. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues. Uh, Carla, if you have any other comments. Um, you know, it's a rapidly evolving situation, and I think uh, most of our clients are trying to navigate it by using us and other consultants that they work with to try to benchmark, right? The question we get the most is, what is everybody else doing? Is everybody else paying people to stay home? Well, then we're going to do that, too, and sort of feel better if there's this collective, well, everybody's doing it, so because we aren't getting any guidance from the EEOC or OSHA or whatever, um, you know, we can at least try to, uh, you know, benchmark as best we can and do what most people are doing. So you know, are, are you hearing stories of employers collaborating? Because, for example, I've reached out to, you know, top leaders from, you know, you know, huge employee benefits consulting firms, employer associations. Um, and, and literally everyone I talked to the last couple of weeks was like, ah, this is nothing. You know, nobody really has to worry about. It. Don't have to prepare. Now that we're starting to see it progress and come about. Um, you know, do you, you know, is, is there something in place? Does something need to be built for employers to collaborate on these issues? Well, we're seeing employers do that by industry. So webinars like this one, we presented at one for retail uh, employers. I mean, I think people are trying to benchmark by industry because the issues by industry are different. Are you an industry where people can work from home? Are you a law firm or are you a trucking company? I mean, people are trying to mobilize by industry. Great. Well, thank you both. It was uh, really great and informative and, uh, you know, hope to have you on another one uh, soon and really wish everyone, you know, good luck and, uh, you know, this uh, new path that we have to take in dealing with uh, COVID-19. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Take care.